I believe that literature is made mostly out of more literature. So books played an immense role in my upbringing as, as a writer. I uh, started reading very young. I read a lot of comic books. Uh, that's, that, that was my entryway. And then I started reading short stories. Um, and eventually I discovered Borges, who really changed my, my reading life. And because um, Borges is so full of other uh, references, that that was sort of a gateway to 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 his own personal canon that really shaped my taste uh, for for many years. What I found initially in stories, I think, um, and what I still find in stories is enormous pleasure. Uh, th that to me is the main driving force. Uh, uh, what keeps me reading and what keeps me writing. It's it's a form of pleasure that I can't derive from anything else. And the strange thing for me about literature, the, the wondrous thing for me about literature, is that it conjoins this, this aesthetic pleasure, this, this emotional experience, together with an intellectual dimension. So this constellation uh, that unites uh, Emotion, pleasure, and 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 intellectual insight. I don't think I don't think there is um, another art form that that is that is able to do that uh, to that extent. Mainly because I I believe that literature's prime material is meaning, right? It's meaning, uh, and and literature is there to show us how there can be beauty in meaning. Uh, uh, and, and, and this is, I think, what makes the literary experience uh, so unique. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of addicted to that feeling. I, this is, I'm, I'm hunting uh, for this feeling all the time. This is what I want to experience as a reader and as a writer. My first recollections as a, as a child are in Sweden. I, I, I have, those are my first memories. Uh, they're, they take place in Stockholm and they're in Swedish uh, and in Spanish. We spoke Spanish at home, and, uh, but my first social tongue out in the world was, was uh, Swedish. So my friendships were Swedish friendships and of course school. And, and, and all of that. But there, there was this duality, you know, uh, as with so many immigrant families who uh, have um, this kind of bilingual experience. And I, and I think that that shaped my relationship with language in a very profound way, uh, in terms of uh, always being very aware, I think, of what is going on, even as I speak, even now that I'm that I'm that I'm uttering these very words, um, the, there is there is sort of a syntactic kind of um, uh, analysis, a lexical kind of analysis going on at at, at every time. There's a hyper awareness uh, that is a little bit exhausting, <laughs> but. Um, but very helpful when you're a writer. Um, so, 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 and then of course I ended up migrating um, voluntarily to the English language, which is the lang my language of, of choice. Um, you know, as I said, I grew up bilingually in, in, in Sweden and then the whole family moved back to Argentina. I went to, to college in Argentina, did my under Graduate, I, took, I got my undergraduate degree in, in sort of the equivalent of comparative literature in, 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 at the University of Buenos Aires. Uh, um, but I, during those years, I also fell in love, during my teens, actually, I fell in love with the English language. You know, I was, I was born into uh, Spanish. I sort of was forced to acquire Swedish because of the circumstances. I was very young, so it wasn't really that, that traumatic or anything. But then I chose uh, uh, English, and I've only ever written fiction in, in English. And I've 
effectively now spent most of my life in English speaking countries. My biography definitely shaped my writing and my writing style and the way in which I relate to language. Each language uh, allows us to say different things. Uh, uh, Roland Barthes said famously that language is fascist because it, it, you know, it forces us to say things in certain ways and doesn't allow us to say other things. You could, you could take that even, even, even farther and say that you can only imagine the world and perceive the world uh, in this linguistic frame that, that you're given or, or that you have uh, uh, acquired. So definitely, you know, having grown up in, in, in different languages has, uh, has widened my, my, my perception of, of the utterable, <laughs> if, if you like. And, and it's a beautiful challenge sometimes to think of something that, that I know exactly, I know exactly how to articulate it in, let's say, in Spanish or in Swedish, but not in English, and to find uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of detours uh, to to arrive at a at a similar point. It's it's not always the same point. Uh, I wouldn't say those moments are very frequent, uh, but but when they happen, it's. It's a nice intellectual uh, challenge to, and and it's very prismatic to look at at this object that is um, partially unnameable, and 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 see how it can be addressed from different angles. But to go back to English, I, you know, I think that may have been the the most decisive event in my in my life, uh, having fallen in love with with this language and because it's because it's love there is also this utter commitment and fidelity to it to to the point that i'm you know I, i've decided to live my life in in english speaking countries that's how intense that love for that language was and still is so so that 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 I insist with that word, that event, uh, really, really, sh really shaped who I, who I am to this day. Uh, and because we're, we're talking about love, it's very, it's very hard to, to explain it. It's, 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 it's something that, that occurred. It, it's something that, that happened to me. And, and there is something about the English language that I find that uh, that I that I find very stimulating that I don't find in in the other languages that I know more or less. If you think of a sculptor, uh, you know why 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 does a sculpt a certain sculptor prefer to work with wood, another one with bronze, another one with marble? Uh, uh, there is there is something that it's almost uh, well tactile for sure in the in the case of of sculpture, but but there is almost a tactile dimension for me with the English language. That is sort of the material that 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 speaks to me. That is ma that is most malleable to me, and I love its syntax. Uh, I love its its uh, uh, its lexical wealth. Uh, I love its double register between the sort of Anglo-Saxon Germanic uh, register and and the Latinate register and what you can do. With that, it's 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 beautiful. It's it's my instrument of choice. I've always wanted to be a writer. I, I never wanted to be a, a you know a firefighter or a, or an astronaut. I always wanted to be a writer. I I have this memory of showing my mother some scribbles and saying I, I wrote this thing and I I didn't know how to write. It, it was just doodles, you know, <laughs> but. It, so strong was the desire uh, to write that I, you know, I, 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 I claim to have done it before I even knew the alphabet. But as, as soon as I effectively learned how to write, I started writing, uh, you know, stories. Uh, uh, I, I drew awful comic books. I wrote even more awful poems. I was, I was always writing as, as, a, as a kid. 
and I, and I knew, I always knew that I would do something related to books, storytelling, language. Initially, that that meant uh, becoming an academic for for a while, uh, and 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 coming to literature from that from that kind of. Uh, uh, Angle. I was very invested in literary theory and philosophy, and 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 that's what I did for a number of years. I always kept writing, but 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 I believed for for a while that 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 would be my my career. But eventually, fi fiction writing overtook uh, academic writing, and I feel they're they're very antithetical in 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 in, in sort of in in form and in tone, and in uh, they require a different kind of mindset. I have I have a bit of a beef with the term research when applied to literature, and I I tend to sort of go on a rant with this, so so forgive me. But my beef with research applied to the literary realm is that research, of course, is a word that comes from science, and it has to do with obtaining verifiable results, uh, you know, and and. Uh, 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 claims that are falsifiable, that you can contrast empirically with, um, uh, with the referential world. Uh, so research implies a very strict definition of truth behind it. And I think literature comes, has its own specific relationship to truth that has nothing to do with all the things that I just said. I think there is a much, much better word than research when it comes to literature, and that word is reading. Uh, reading has nothing to do with the protocols uh, uh, involved in research that are very strict. Uh, reading should be a bit cha chaotic, it should be haphazard, it should be led by emotion rather than uh, by uh, a method. Um, uh, or maybe a combination of both. I try to avoid the word research applied to myself, al although I've done a bunch of it as an academic, and I'm, I'm well-trained in archival work, you know, uh, but, but I, like, I prefer to think, it's more helpful to me to think about what I'm doing as reading. You know, I'm here at the New York Public Library right now at the Coleman Center, where I was a fellow for a year, and I had access to the entire collection, including manuscripts and, you know, uh, the rare book collection. And, and even here, my, my, my approach was guided by this kind of myst rather mysterious um, drive, um, rather than uh, a methodical, scientific uh, approach. So, so I, I defend uh, this notion of reading over over research. But I would say also that what I got from my life as an academic is to be unafraid of um, slowness in prose. Uh, uh, there is a certain velocity, in, especially in, in dense philosophical texts, that force you, the reader, to slow down. And it's a, it's a completely different gear that may be available in some experimental literature, but I still feel it's different, right? So I feel that reading that tradition, you know, of, of, of philosophical texts uh, uh, gave, me, gave me that experience of, of, of this viscosity of language, of this density of language that I sometimes, not always, because I'm also interested in speed sometimes, but as a writer, right? Um, but um, it's, it's, it's nice for me to, to be able also to, again, to shift gears and go into this, 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 this slower experience of language and slow the reader down. And I think it makes, it makes for a more intense reading experience if, if, you, if you have these ebbs and flows uh, uh, and, and these changes in, in, in tempo. I'm very interested in the notion of point of view in, in literature because it always entails 
very intense formal challenges if you take it seriously. And also because point of view, I think, is, uh, is an ethical question in, in literature. Why? Because point of view has to do with the administration of knowledge within the story. And this entails power, always. What kind of power does the narrative, uh, the narrator have over the narrative and therefore over, over the reader? And I think uh, with, with that power, of course, comes a sense of responsibility. Um, nothing makes me angrier uh, as a reader than when point of view is, is a very strict point of view that has, has been held for a while is violated just to create some kind of flashy reveal. Um, um, that, that makes me very angry. Or when we have an omniscient narrator, for instance, in a, in a, in a crime story, who knows even what characters maybe have dreamt the night before, but the narrator doesn't know who the killer is. So, so you see that that, that discrepancy there is highly manipulative. And, and, and I'm very careful about that, about not being manipulative with the reader. That, that is of the utmost importance to me, again, because I, I believe it's an ethical issue. Um, within the distance, the experiment was to have um, a very, very strict, close third person uh, point of view. Uh, I tried to, I experimented writing it in the first person. Uh, I can talk about the problems that arose from that, but in the end, it was, it was best to do it this way. And it's so close that for like f the first three quarters of the novel, the, the, the protagonist doesn't understand English, and therefore the narrator, the third person narrator, doesn't either. So, so everything is just noise around him. We, we don't know what's going on. Um, because again, I try to be faithful to, to that point of view. And I feel that that was a necessity for that project because in the distances to a large extent, a, a book about isolation and claustrophobia, and I was hoping to heighten that with this point of view and this, this kind of suffocating closeness set in this enormously vast expanse. So that dissonance to me was what drove the, the, the project forward. So I, I feel formally uh, there was a necessity for this uh, to also to, to hopefully uh, uh, allow the reader to, to experience that, that sense of, of, of suffocation. With trust, I think partially I, I just forced myself to do something really different. I wanted to, I wanted to try my hand at, at a radically different a project in this regard, in, in, in terms of point of view, in terms of uh, narratorial voice, uh, uh, and, and in terms of structure. So indeed, we, we have four very different voices in, in four extremely different genres even. You know, one is a novel within the novel, then there is this, this kind of a shattered historical document, uh, then there is a memoir, and then there is a personal diary. Um, and and uh, some of them are, are written with you know almost half a century apart from each other. So there is also that other component. It was it was a wonderful challenge. Uh, I think again this this formal configuration was necessary. Just as within the distance, it was necessary to have this claustrophobic uh, point of view. In trust, it was necessary to have this polyphonic uh, structure because it's a novel about voice. It's a novel about who has a voice and who's denied a voice. So in the early stages of the book, the book didn't start out like this, uh, but I realized that instead of merely thematizing this, instead of merely making the issue of voice a topic of the book, I would enact it. Uh, Formally, uh, and and that's that's really when the when the when the, when the book took off. So I feel this kind of tectonic layering of of of, of voices uh, is is very much an, an 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 essential part of how 
the story is told and what the story is about. Uh, you know, who, who, who is given sort of a megaphone in, in history and, and who, on the other hand, is gagged. I, I feel that the, the book is to an enormous extent uh, about that. And the exploration of genres was also very, very important. Uh, a moment ago, we were talking about the relationship between fiction and, and truth. And, and, and that is a central concern in, in trust. Um, the four voices, the four, the four genres, the four documents within, within the novel uh, invite the reader to ask themselves uh, about the assumptions with which they walk into a text. Each time we read any text, we are uh, uh, signing a tacit contract with, with that text. There are terms and conditions that we scroll through too hastily, uh, usually, and then we uh, hit click and go in, uh, and we are very eager to assign a truth value to, to some texts for a number of reasons, while we excuse other texts uh, to, again, too hastily uh, from having any kind of relationship to truth. This is at the core of the book, and of course, uh, uh, at the heart of this question is this ever evanescent line that that distinguishes history and uh, and uh, and and fiction. So so that distinction to me was also something that I wanted to explore through these four documents. I hope I'm not coming off as as too kind of um, opinionated uh, again by saying that historical fiction is a very complicated term for me and I don't I don't identify with it. I don't I don't think that I'm that I write historical fiction. The the problem with historical fiction is that there is an implied hierarchy there. A hierarchy by which uh, history is closer to truth than fiction. Right, um, uh, history seems to be anchored, moored, uh, more robustly in, in 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 truth than than fiction, and yet, you know, the work of historians and historiographers of the, at least the last half century or whatever has shown us repeatedly how history is an ideological device. Right, at the same time, in the West, we have a few millennia of fiction that I think have shown us with a great degree of accuracy and truthfulness what it means to be a human on planet Earth. So I think we shouldn't be so uh, eager to, to assign a greater truth value to history than we do to fiction. Again, these are very different relationships to truth and I think uh, that shouldn't be forgotten. But also saying that there is such a thing as historical fiction implies that there is something like a historical fiction or that there is some kind of fiction that is divorced from history. And I don't, I don't, I don't think this is, I don't think this is true. Um, uh, so again, it, it doesn't seem like a term that explains a lot to me. And, and I object to the ideological uh, uh, assumptions behind it. I don't, I'm, I'm a fiction, I'm, again, I'm a fiction writer. I, I defend the power of fiction. I, I defend the place of imagination within, within fiction more than, you know, bearing witness or, or being, uh, or, or this testimonial notion of, of literature or, or, or literature that should reflect sort of firsthand experience. I, I really defend uh, uh, the mediations involved in, in, in fiction. I'm a little trepidatious to say that anything that I write is a commentary on, on, on current events. At the same time, I, I just said a moment ago that all fiction is historical. So, of course, you know, I, 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 I live in today's world inevitably and I'm connected to it and I'm a you know, 
more or less well-informed person who is affected by everything that happens. I, I, I feel it and, uh, and, and much of it horrifies me. So uh, I'm, I'm far from claiming that I'm writing, you know, in, in, in a vacuum from, from that. And the novel was indeed written during the Trump administration where reality felt Reality itself was under attack, <laughs> and and reality itself had been commodified, and reality itself had become almost a luxury good that could be purchased and imposed on onto others, despite you know what our senses were 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 telling us about our surroundings. So when I when I started writing the book, uh, trust, I also you know steeped myself in materials that I that I read here at the library, for instance, from the 1920s and 30s, uh, you know, the, the big boom the, the, uh, during the 20s, this, this age of, of, of excess and, and profound inequality, followed, uh, of course, by the Great Depression. And <clears throat> it was shocking to see the continuities between the 1920s and the 2020s. Uh, you know, with the Republican administrations at the time. Uh, we think of the jazz age, which is a term I despise, uh, and we think of this never-ending party of, of the 20s. The Republican administrations at the time were appalling. Um, it was Harding, President Harding, who ran with the slogan, America first. Um, so, uh, does that ring a bell? So the, the, you know, American exceptionalism and isolationism were rampant. Um, uh, there was the Immigration Quota Act from 1924 that uh, uh, shut the borders to people from specific regions, uh, Italy and Asia. Uh, and at the same time here, you know, families were uh, being separated at the border and children were being put in Put in, put in cages. Um, uh, the uh, markets were deregulated. Uh, there, there were tax cuts that were of almost 50% for the wealthy. There were definitely parallels between both, uh, you know, the, 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 the period in which trust was set and the reality in which it was written. This was unintentional. Uh, I didn't that's not, I, I wasn't looking for them. They were simply there. And, and, you know, it's not by mere chance that these people are called conservatives. You know, they're, they're, they, they're, their playbook has been the same for, for 100 years, the same. I don't have a didactical view of literature. I don't have a pedagogical view of literature. I don't think it's there to teach us anything. I don't have a practical view of literature, a pragmatic view of literature. I don't think it should serve any given purpose. I think the, the beauty of literature is, resides partly in its uselessness. It's something that in, in, in an instrumental society where everything should serve a purpose, li literature doesn't and it shouldn't. And, and that, that to me gives me great joy. Uh, so, so for me, literature is inhabiting this space of language. It's being immersed in language. It's, uh, it's, it's the experience by which we're able to to see uh, a certain form of beauty that is unavailable elsewhere. It should be a joyful uh, experience. Uh, at the same time, literature has an ability to make us see and feel things that go beyond our own personal experiences and our, the constraints of our, of, of our you know, determinations of our, of, of our, of our lives. Um, and so I, I love to read and hope to write literature that opens up the world. 
I, I hope I never write literature that is like a selfie and, and that captures me in, a, in any given moment. I honestly don't want to be in what I write. I, I fail. I'm inevitably there, which is sad. But, but I, again, I would, I would like to be able to imagine uh, as, as a writer things beyond my grasp. And as a reader, I'm very grateful each time my horizons are broadened by, by literature.